Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to part five of this series that we are calling ZK in Context. Uh, you guys are already uh, uh, deep in the weeds with our first audit. Uh, so today we will continue the uh, our uh, journey into understanding the context of zero knowledge. So we came across statements that are beyond provability in the formalistic view of mathematical truths. And we established that within the infinite set of provable statements, there are some truths that are beyond decidability. The proof is out there, but we can't create a machine or an algorithm that settles or decides it in all cases and in a finite and unambiguous number of steps. And today we turn our attention to the green set here, the set of decidable statements. These nested circles denote sets and subsets in the mathematical sense. So the set of the undecidable can also be called the set of in principle provable, which is a subset of all expressible statements out there. Uh, remember also that one infinite set can be a subset of another infinite set, despite the fact that they have the same cardinality as we talked about. Uh, between decidable and undecidable, we could also delineate a set called recognizable or recursively enumerable as it's otherwise known, but it's not too important for us. It's just a small note for the curious. Um, it is the infinite set of statements that can be decided if they are true, the statement belongs to the language, but cannot be decided if they are false. Well, the statement is not in the language. Um, we are kind of circling back to where we started. The problems we went over are decidable. We can describe fairly simply and straightforwardly simple algorithms to decide whether a given instance is in or outside the language, or equivalently and less formally, whether or not it has a solution. We group these problems into the same set because they are reducible to each other cheaply. The reduction procedures are very straightforward and cheap. And because of that reducibility, a machine for one is a machine for all of them. And a quick algorithm for one is automatically a quick algorithm for all because the reduction itself is cheap. We need to be more precise about the classification of problems, about their equivalence, and about the computational resources that must be expended to solve them. Indeed, uh, computational costs will be um, the criteria by which we separate problems into different classes. So the ambiguous uh, blue words are about problems, the blue ones, and the red ones, they are about machines or algorithms or proofs. These are all equivalent characterizations. So we need to measure the feasibility and the tractability. Um, th this is in terms of machines or algorithms. The feasibility of computation is something we already touched upon by proving there, there exist more languages than there are machines to decide them. This is what we saw last time in the diagonalization-based uh, proof. We also know uh, the famous concrete undecidable problem, namely the halting problem. It is infeasible to decide that one. Uh, so we already established a, a boundary between the feasible and the unfeasible without even defining a concrete model of computation or a machine. This is what Turing did. But tractability is something we will visit today. Uh, and in terms of languages or problems inside the green set, we want to group them, group the problems into hierarchical sets based on the tractability of solving them. We can more pro pro productively speak of classes of problems as opposed to uh, an individual algorithm for each problem. And this is actually a powerful idea. It allows us to reason about and actually create universal machines that decide classes wholesale. So we can speak collectively for entire classes of problems. 
So to summarize what we need, a measure of tractability and a classification criteria. One thing is about machines and one thing is about the problems or languages. And once again, as I mentioned in the very, very beginning of the series, reductions, the notion of reduction will be our uh, flashlight, basically. It will be the one thing that helps us define those boundaries in the vast infinite set that we call decidable problems. Okay, so let's go over the Turing machine. Uh, it is our favorite machine abstraction, which will use uh, which we will subsequently use to reason about the cost of computations and the equivalency of classes of computations. The Turing machine is an abstract computational model. It's an abstract object, but you can think of it as in concrete terms as a head, a tape, and a number of finite states. You can think of the head as the CPU register or the CPU head that is you know, moving. And you can think of the tape as the disk. You just need to assume that it's infinite. And the number of states is a read-only memory. It's, it's a, a couple of a finite number of states that the machine is in and it's stored and it doesn't change. Another way of having a concrete image of what this uh, machine is, it's sort of equivalent to uh, what, you know, our very first computation as kids, when we do things on with a pen on paper, you can think of the head as the pen and your eyes, you know, and the tape as an infinite amount of paper that you use and reuse. And the states, you can think of them as a, a bunch of sticky notes that kind of like, uh, you use to help you keep track of where you are in the computation. And this is just another way of having a concrete uh, image of this com uh, abstract uh, computational model is. More uh, of seven things. You have a number of finite states, finite uh, alphabet symbols. Uh, you have a blank symbol input symbols, initial state, and a final state. But the, uh, the heart of the machine is actually this thing, the, the transition function. This is the function that takes the machine from single state and moves it into another. And in the process, writing something or overwriting something and moving the head left or right. So it takes a pair state other than the final state, and a symbol that is currently being read by the head. That's where like the head is pointing to. And based on that, it transitions into a different state, overwrites the current position potentially with another symbol, and it moves the head either left or right. Remember our discussion about the need for a mathematical language of truths that we can use to define stuff? Well, this is such an example of our need to define something more concretely. And Turing defined this uh, abstract model using set theory, basically. The, the computational model we use to reason about computation doesn't actually matter. This is because every model anyone has ever come up with is reducible to the Turing machine. So you reduce from the Turing machine and into your favorite computational model in order to prove that your model is just as powerful. We call that Turing completeness. So if you wanted to prove that your new favorite programming language is Turing complete, you, you, know, you reduce from the Turing machine into that language. And thereby you prove that the two are equally powerful. But you also reduce from your favorite model into the Turing machine to prove that your model is not more powerful than the Turing machine. And so we can safely continue using it as our go-to um, mental model of computation. All of these models that I'm listing here that are actually real, that have been uh, you know, uh, proposed or implemented. So they are all actual computational models and they're all equivalent to the Turing machine. So 
over time, we came up, we came to the conclusion that the, the if the model is power, sufficiently powerful, it's uh, Turing complete. Um, so the church Turing reduction or thesis, it's not a concrete thing, it's an empirical thing. Uh, because we don't have a mathematical definition of an, uh, what an algorithm is. We just know that it's a generalized notion of what we have classically known as uh, proofs. But empirically speaking, over the decades, all the computational models that have been proposed, including the earliest one, like the church Turing, uh, the, the, the church's uh, lambda calculus, for example, they, they have been shown to be reducible to the Turing machine. Lambda calculus, by the way, is somewhat similar to functional programming if you have worked with those. Now, if you add bells and whistles to the Turing machine itself, like more tapes, for example, it doesn't actually add, it turned out that it doesn't add any additional computational powers. You can reduce a multi-tape Turing machine into a single tape Turing machine without any significant blow-ups. Okay, so the Turing machine, why is it our go-to model of computation? It's because it sits at the sweet spot between the abstract and the concrete. Reasoning about the cost of computations or the feasibility or lack thereof of computation based on, let's say, silicon-based machines that we have today or programming languages, th that opens a can of worms in terms of overheads, uh, performance differences between different architectures, you get into infinite arguments of Rust versus C, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other extreme, okay, we can just reason about uh, computations uh, based on, you know, like, um, based on like ad hoc notations on a whiteboard. It's, it would be too loose. And it's not interoperable or composable. You can't base one proof on a picture of another proof on a whiteboard that someone previously came up with. So the Turing machine is uh, is is the mo most popular machine model because it's concrete enough. It's it's a mathematical object, but it's also uh, it's abstract enough. It's a mathematical clean object, but it's also um, uh, concrete. You can imagine it. You can have a mental a picture of it, the head, the tape, etc. We could speak of one universal machine that simulates the infinite sets of purpose-specific Turing machines. There is a Turing machine for knapsack, one for SAT, one for addition, one for sorting, etc., etc. But we can more easily just speak of a universal Turing machine that takes those ones as input and it just simulates them. All we have to do is define a universal uh, encoding for all machines. Just like you remember when we encoded machines using numbers and we turned them into binary. So they are just a bunch like a series, uh, you know, they are just strings of zeros and ones. And there is no significant overhead. If you take your computation, if you take your purpose specific Turing machine and simulated in, in the universal Turing machine, there is not much overhead. The blow, uh, the, the, the blow up is at most linear, which is okay. You can think of the Java virtual machine, for example, as a universal machine. It takes bytecode of arbitrary Java programs and it simulates their execution. In fact, um, because we can, I mentioned this already, but you know, just to you know, emphasize, we can simulate the universal Turing machine in Java, we know, and as a result, we know that the Java virtual machine is Turing complete. Assuming, of course, that, you know, uh, we have unlimited disk space, unlimited space, basically. So this is one way of you making a concrete understanding of the universal Turing machine. You can think of it as the JVM, for example, with infinite disk space. Okay, let's now talk about the cost of computation in more precise terms now that we have a reference machine to measure against. This is what an adder machine does basically, okay, uh, on a Turing machine. So we look over the computation and we 
tally up the, the, the cost that we are expending in terms of time, the head movement, and in terms of space, how much stuff is being written into onto the, the, the tape. And if you add them up, you can, you know, uh, come up with a concrete, you know, an exact number of uh, an exact number signifying the, the, the cost, basically. But this is not clean enough. OK, this is kind of like messy and we, we want to be a bit more, uh, a bit cleaner, basically. So we only actually care about the leading term. We don't care about constants or coefficients anywhere. OK, we, we just don't care about them and we don't care if we are being a bit not that precise. We just care about the, the, uh, the, the leading term, basically. And to signify the fact that we don't care about constants or coefficients, we use this notation, which is called the, the big O notation. It simply means that the cost of computation is bounded above by some polynomial in the input size, the input size being n. So in the case of addition, n is the length of the two numbers, you know, concatenated together. n is always the input size. It's the number of occupied squares on the machine before it begins execution. So in SAT, for example, that's the number of variables. In knapsack, it's the number of items. In exact cover, it's the number of subsets. With the decoloring, it's the graph size, et cetera, et cetera. So here on the left, you have like a concrete characterization of the number of steps. But as I said, we don't care. We only care about the leading term and we don't care about constants. So if there is a con, you know, Coefficient here, we, we just drop it. We don't care about, about that. Uh, now, constant, just a small note, constant can be huge, but that doesn't happen very often in reality. So uh, when they do happen, we just point them out. But in almost all cases, the uh, constants are reasonably small, so we don't care about them. So we, we can now be more precise about easy and hard problems. So the easy class of problems are those whose cost of computation is bounded by some polynomial in the input size. Some polynomial, so it's n to the power something. That's a polynomial. And k is 1 or 2, et cetera. Now, again, what if k, OK, what if k is 10 to the power 78? That's the number of atoms in the universe. That's obviously an extremely expensive computation. We can't call that cheap. But again, in practice, it turned out that the constants involved, okay, in computations that are bounded by a polynomial, the constants involved, okay, whether coefficients or exponents, they tend to be small. So in the rare cases where the constants are huge, we just point them out, basically. It, it does happen in practice sometimes. So these are examples of cheap problems, other not, uh, you know, otherwise known by the sexy name P, as in polynomial. So the cost is bounded by a polynomial input size. And the, the, in this class, there is only one for, you can think of it in terms of uh, you know, the forking that we talked about. It, it, they are the computations in which at every step, there is only one fork. So in addition, for example, arithmetic addition or sorting, you know exactly what to do at each step. There is no two possible forks. So what if the number of forks is greater than one? At each, at any given step, there could be more than one possible pass that the machine can take and the machine has to explore. So this, this notion will be the criteria by which we define our next uh, class. So, if we imagine a hypothetical Turing machine that can magically pick the right fork at each step, then we can still cheaply solve this set of problems that we discussed previously. Now, whether or not this magical power can ever be realized in practice is an open question. It's the famous P versus MP uh, question, and there is $1 million prize uh, to whoever solve it. So, um, but but we are imagining uh, that, that the machine has this non-deterministic non-deterministic power in order to define this class. 
So we have defined two classes. P is the set of problems solvable in polynomial time deterministically, and MP is the set of problems solvable also in polynomial time, but non-deterministically. So non-deterministically means the machine is able to pick the right fork at each step. So it, it, it doesn't struggle like we did with, you know, getting stuck and backtracking. So this is just a hypothetical property. So you can think of, of, of this hypothetical non-deterministic property as having some sort of superpower, you know, that allows the machine to magically pick the right fork at each step. Just to point out that, you know, why P is a subset, remember these are mathematical sets that we are delineating here. P is a subset of, of NP because P is a special case where the number of forks at each step is one. Okay, when doing arithmetic, there is no ambiguity with what you have to do at each step. Uh, so that's, P is just a special case. Okay, so, you know, yeah, as you can see, we're coming full circle to meet the problems that we started with. And this is the name of their class, NP, very sexy name, or Pafapin, as I called it, pick a fork in the road and backtrack if necessary. Now, at the time, we stressed this notion of getting struck, getting stuck and backtracking. And we said, it's coming to common to all of them. Well, that commonality, we captured it with this notion of the... Uh, the non-deterministic ability of a machine to solve them. Okay, so our next reduction will teach us more about this MP class and the notion of, you know, we're gonna see the notion of completeness. And uh, this reduction is one of the most important, if not the most important result in computer science and potentially in all of mathematics. It's a giant leap. And in this reduction, we take the input of the, the description, rather, of a Turing machine, and we turn that into a satisfiability formula, a SAT formula that is satisfiable if and only if the Turing machine holds with accept or yes or true. These are all the same thing. If you think about it, okay, the non-deterministic Turing machine, you know, de deciding MP problems at any given step T in its execution, okay, um, we can pin down the four um, the four conditions that ensure the execution is correct. The machine is in one and only one correct state. The head is pointing to one and only one correct square on the tape. This square contains the right simple at that step, and the transition is one square at a time. So arriving at that step, the machine made one transition only. Um, if these four are satisfied, then the machine execution is correct. So these four requirements, what we will do through the reduction is capture each one of them into sad propositions we can capture them with conjunctions of disjunctions or set propositions. So for example, this is the first criteria. The, at step T, the machine is in the right state. So there is a QTI for each uh, step. Okay. Um, now, notice something subtle here, okay? In the carb reductions that we saw in the first and second sessions, you can think of them as the reduction procedure. You can think of it as a compiler. It is compiling the instance into another instance. But here, you can think of this as an interpreter, okay? Like Python interpreter, for example. It interprets the machine state in each step. It interprets that into, uh, a sad proposition, okay? And so we do something similar for the, the other three requirements. We just capture them into propositions like this one. 
And we, what you get at the end is a bunch of propositions, which you combine together with ands as well. And that entire SAT proposition will capture correct machine execution. And the, the entire SAT will evaluate to one if and only if the machine uh, lands on the accept state. So on the left, you see the, the, the Turing machine, the seven tuple uh, Turing machine, and it's reduced to a bunch of conjunctions and disjunctions, and they are all aggregated into one big SAT formula. Oops. Um, notice also that you need to add some uh, supplementary propositions to ensure, for example, the initial conditions were valid, okay? And the 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 halting uh, the the condition at the final state is also valid, meaning the the entire formula evaluates one and so on. So the, there is some you know uh, extra uh, plumbing, extra propositions that you add. And notice also that the definition of the non-deterministic Turing machine is the same as the Turing machine itself. There is no difference in terms of form, formal definition. We just assume that it has this magical power of picking the right fork at every time. So importantly, you know, and uh, very, very importantly, the, 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 the resulting SAT formula is satisfiable if and only if the Turing machine uh, lands on accept. We ensure this by construction. And indeed, this is what Stephen Cook proved. Uh, the, the whole proof is actually only have a page or so, okay? But it was a massive leap in uh, our understanding of this class of problems, if not of like mathematics generally. Uh, the reason why I, I, I say it's important for mathematics generally is because the classical notion of mathematical proofs, Pythagorean theorems, etc., it's in fact the class in P itself, if you think about it. Uh, we talked about this, I think, like starting from the axioms and as you derive more and more true statements from them, you have multiple valid forks from any given uh, uh, statement in your favorite axiomatic system. There is multiple other statements that you can go to. And what you're trying to prove is whether a series of choices of those forks leads to the proof that you are trying to ascertain the validity of. So the class in P is exactly, precisely the class of ma classical mathematical proofs that you think about. And this is why I say it's, uh, you know, this reduction, it has a huge implication for mathematics itself. Okay. So we have a, mach a Turing machine that has some guessing power and it can solve all the problems in MP and polynomial time, which we consider cheap. SAT is one such problem in the class MP. To solve SAT, the machine correctly guesses the next assignment for the next variable. Is it zero or is it one? And it does so in n steps, n being the size of SAT. So it picks the right work every time. But now we establish that SAT itself captures the non-deterministic Turing machine itself. And therefore, SAT is complete for the class or MP complete. It's, an, it's all encompassing of the entire class. If you have an ASIC for SAT, you can solve any problem in MP. You just reduce or compile into it. Or you can take the Turing machine for each MP problem and reduce it into SAT. And then you solve it and then translate the result back into the context of your problem. It's just like we did in the first and second sessions. Whatever machine that you're using to solve MP problems, be it the JVM or Rust compiler or the pen, paper, and sticky notes or whatever, we can compile that computation into satisfiability. If not directly, then through the uh, Turing machine, the non-determinist Turing machine. Now, here's another implication. SAT is complete for the entire MP class, okay? SAT is reducible to three coloring which is itself reducible to exact cover, which is reducible to knapsack, et cetera, et cetera. We saw these reductions earlier in the series. Therefore, all these problems are also MP complete. A machine for one is a machine for all of them. We just reduce and compile into it. We can take any problem in MP and reduce it into one of these problems, whether directly, as I said, or indirectly 
via whether directly like through the the, the uh, through the um, uh, like, we, like through the um, Turing machine like we know in theory we know for a fact that SAT captures the entire class so there must be a path from any problem in, from any problem into SAT or we can indirectly do it through another problem for convenience if it's easier. So uh, one uh, possible path that we can always use for all in NP is that we take the NP problem, we create a Turing machine for it, and then we take that Turing machine and reduce it into SAT following Cook's reduction. Okay, so we have the subset of NP that we are calling NP complete. Okay, there are out problems outside of P, so problems that require making a decision of which fork to pick at every time. They are outside of P, but inside MP, but they are still not MP complete. One such example is the prime vectorization problem, which is used uh, in, in the uh, RSA. And the security of that scheme actually depends on that problem being hard, meaning it depends on the fact that we don't know in practice of a, a quick way of picking the right fork every time. But that problem is, an, is interesting because it's not NP complete. We don't know if it's NP complete or not. So it is possible for a problem to be in NP and being hard, but without being in NP, NP complete. Okay, so these are the two massive implications of Cook's reduction from the Turing machine to SAT. And there is a third implication, which is very relevant to the circum compiler that we're dealing with in our audit. If an MP complete problem is verifiable in zero knowledge, then the entire class is also verifiable. One property of NP problems generally, as we said, not just MP complete, but all of MP, is that if someone solves an instance, we can verify their work cheaply. Notice that now we have a concrete notion of cheap when I say cheaply. We said cheap, we means polynomial. Um, in fact, uh, verification of supposed solution of any MP complete problems can be actually verified in, in, uh, in linear time. So in a polynomial with an exponent one. So for the MP complete problems we came across, these are the certificates or witnesses that we need to go over to verify the correctness uh, uh, of them. This is just a, a reminder of uh, what we went through. Um, so the question is, okay, can we verify the solution of one of these MP problems without revealing any information about the witness? It's obvious when if, if uh, Bezos sent us a, a set of variable assignments, we said it's straightforward to, you know, um, plug them into the formula and know if it's true or not. But can we do that, okay? can pr basis prove to us that the solution is correct without actually revealing the witness. So to go back to the imp third implication, we said if a problem can be uh, verified in ZK, then all of them are because it's MP complete. So we reduce from three SAT to three coloring, but three SAT is reducible onto from regular SAT, which is reducible from the non-deterministic Turing machine itself. So, you know, three coloring is MP complete. I'm just uh, reiterating that. Remember the, the, the question in the three coloring problem. We are asking if there is a way to color the nodes in the graph such that no two nodes um, have the same color. And we only have three colors. So let's look at how we can solve and verify three coloring, the MP complete three coloring in zero knowledge. Okay, so imagine Bezos draws the entire graph on a football field. It's it's a giant, giant graph. Okay, so the graph is drawn into, on, on the field. It's not colored yet, it's just drawn. Now, Bezos solves the instance or his minions uh, at w AWS, they solve it and they text him the valid assignment of nodes and colors. And supposedly, 
uh, what they have sent them, what they what they have sent him is a valid assignment. Each node is colored with one of the three colors, and no two neighbor nodes have the same color. Okay. And now Bezos is going to cover each ball. He he placed a ball of a certain color on each node. Okay. And then he covered the ball with a cone. So imagine each node in the field being covered with a yellow cone. Okay. And supposedly the uh, assignment of all the ball is valid and correct. At this at this moment, you imagine you being the verifier. You walked into the football field. Okay, they invited you in. So you walk in and you see the graph, but all the nodes are covered with codes, so they are being hidden. And what you do is you select an edge and at random in the graph. You walk around in the field and you say, okay, reveal this edge to me. Reveal, remove the cone on top of the two nodes connected by this edge. So, you know, they remove it and you look at the UNV and indeed they are, they have different balls, uh, different, they have balls of different colors on each one of them. So at least for that edge, the, the assignment is correct. And then you exit the field. Okay. Now, Bezos may not, in fact, have a valid coloring of the entire graph. He may be lying about part of the graph. Maybe there is maybe the whole entire graph is, you know, uh, colored correctly, except for one edge, for two nodes in one edge. So the probability that the random edge that you selected is the is that invalid one is one over e one over the number of edges in the entire graph. Obviously, that's not a great probability. So, how do we increase increase the probability of catching you know a, a cheating Bezos? What we want is we want to increase our certainty in the coloring being indeed correct. But Bezos does not want to reveal the information about the witness. He's monetizing this thing, this operation. He's monetizing his ability, AWS ability to solve these problems. And he doesn't want to give us the entire graph. He wants to charge us uh, like every time. Um, because revealing uh, the entire coloring maybe will help us understand the algorithm that he is that he has come up with or something. Okay, so we want certainty, and Bezos wants confidentiality. So we want to be convinced without leaking, without Bezos having to leak more information about the solution. So what Bezos does is, remember, you, you now you are outside the field, you exited the field. So what Bezos does, he shuffles the, co the coloring or he permutes the coloring, okay? He changes red to green, green to blue, blue to red, for example. So the solution remains correct. He just shoveled, okay? The, the, the coloring of a, a given node has changed now from green to, uh, to, to red, for example, but the overall solution did not change. It's still valid. He just created a different permutation of the color, basically. So while you are outside the field, Bezos does this, does this straightforward shoveling. But now if you go back, you go back and you ask him to reveal an edge again, and then you go, you exit, he shovels, you go back and ask him and reveals again. So we do this K times. So we repeat, you, the verifier, entering the field, selecting a random in the edge and verifying that it's colored correctly, we repeat these steps uh, k times. Okay. Now, if we do that, okay, and if k is sufficiently large, then we are very likely to catch a cheating Bezos. Uh, the probability that Bezos is honest. Grow, grows increasingly with K. 
um, and like so there is there is a, a certain K at which we can be fairly certain that he's telling the truth because otherwise we would have caught him with high probability already. It's true that picking a random edge, the probability that 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 specific random edge is the one that is invalidly colored. But if we repeat that so many times, the, pro the, the probability that we eventually pick the right one, the incorrectly colored one, becomes very high. Now, obviously, the protocol that we described is not practical. But in reality, we, use, we actually use a commitment scheme for this step. For the hiding step, we use a commitment scheme, like for example, putting uh, you know nodes and colors in a in a in a Merkle tree leaf and committing to the root of the entire tree, um, and then in the reveal step, okay, when we give a random edge and we ask Bezos to reveal it, he just sends us a Merkle root, for example. Um, and of course, you know, instead of entering and exiting, we use communication over a channel, over the internet, for example. So there you have it. This is a zero knowledge protocol to verify the MP complete problem three coloring. It is MP complete. And therefore, the entire class is verifiable in ZK as well. There is a path for us to compile if any problem in the entire class into three coloring. Um, so to summarize, we have three coloring is MP complete and its execution can be trustlessly outsourced to a prover. And the solution can be verified without revealing any information about the solution, the entire solution or the witness or the certificate. And this is in fact known since the 1980s. This protocol that I just described is known through it since the 80s, for example. So if this is all true, okay, we have an all-encompassing MP-complete problem that is verifiable in ZK, then, and we know this since the 80s, why haven't we been computing in ZK over the three or four decades? We could have, you know, uh, an MP universal computation in ZK for a while now. So why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we taking advantage of this trustless outsourcing of computation? Well, because K must be extremely large. And if you imagine extremely large graphs, okay, you have to re do that uh, commit reveal dance extremely large number of times. So for large graphs, K need to be very, very large in order for us to reach that certainty. So that's one. And two, the witness size, okay, that the prover communicates, even though it's linear, it's, it's still too large for this to make it like worth it. And so uh, the, the, the decomposition, the outsourcing uh, of problems uh, to um, trustlessly to a prover it has to be worth it. The, the asymmetry between proving and verification needs to be improved massively before this becomes you know, practically uh, useful. So to make this, this model practically like attractive, we needed to uh, a few improvements. We need to eliminate this inter interactivity between approver and verifier. We needed to reduce the witness size. Yes, it's linear, but that's still you know, uh, cumbersome and large, especially for large, large instances. Imagine a graph, you know, graphs that are used in physics, for example, of the cosmos, for example, that you have billions and billions of nodes. Um, and, we also, uh, and we also need to reduce the verifier cost. So, it's as if you know the verifier has to be um, has to do much much less work for this entire model to be practically attractive, and this is exactly where tools from number theory, abstract algebra, probability theory, cryptography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, this is where they come in. 
okay? This is, we use those tools to compress proof size, to reduce verification costs, to eliminate interactivity. So those tools um, uh, come in to help us basically um, hammer this like witness uh, verification thing uh, into easier and easier task. Now, those tools and the gains that they provide, they require, you know, our computation to be captured in a series of polynomials that capture the entire computation. So we need to, um, you can think of it as you need, we need to cook or prepare our computation into uh, a format that is friendly to the application of these tools. And that format, it, though, that format is a series of polynomials. Now, the polynomials need to be of uh, the, the computation captured in polynomials need to have the same structure or form every time. Okay, um, because the 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 polynomials in general has to be fixed. Um, and so the the as we will see the computation has to be translated into uh, um, one unique form basically. So arithmetization is basically this: it's the reduction of problems or classes of problems into a system of polynomials, which we can then make assertions about indirectly, without evaluating the entire system. If you have a bunch of polynomials that capture, that have been reduced onto from an MP computation, you can 100%, you know, plug the um, the numbers into the polynomials and verify, yes, all the polynomials evaluate to zero. Uh, that's, how, that, that's how they were structured to be in the reduction. And therefore the computation is correct. But those polynomials are extremely massive and actually evaluating them is more expensive than doing the computation itself. But those, that's where those tools come in. They help us make assertions about the polynomials indirectly without evaluating them in their entirety. So we are kind of here now, the last step. We started from here and we went all the way around and we came to the notion of arithmetization and we understood it to be a necessary step of com reducing computations into a, a bunch of polynomials for us to be able to apply those tools that allow us to make assertions about witnesses very cheaply. Uh, but the reason why we went through all of this is to instill this notion of reduction, is to make you understand and appreciate the, the search versus, versus verify, um, the cost of computations, the universality of it, et cetera, et cetera, in order to understand that this arithmetizations that we do in zero knowledge uh, research um, is a, first of all, it's a reduction, just like any other reductions. A system of polynomials is certainly equivalent to the computation. Um, uh, but also um, to, um, to understand the need for it, basically, to understand why even though, even though verifying these witnesses compared to searching is very, very cheap, okay, it's still not cheap enough for the entire model to be practically attractive. Um, so as we say, we, we, uh, we, we, need, we need those, those tools from all these domains to, um, to reduce the, the cost of witness verification. And in the context of the circumcompiler and the code base we're looking to, this is exactly what happens. We are taking, you know, arbitrary MP statements. We can reduce them into arithmetic circuits. And from there, we reduce it into a, a certain form, okay, that we call R1CS. It's kind of like, you know, you can think of it as the same structure, but the, um, the uh, or you can think of it as like the circuit. The circuit is fixed, but the wires that light up every time depend on the instance. 
And then from there, we reduce it to a system of polynomials, they're equal to zero. And it's from there, okay, once we have them ready in that format, it's there where we can apply uh, those mathematical tools, abstract algebraic tools to make assertion about the polynomials without actually evaluating. So in Friday, we have, uh, well, this Friday and the, next, the Friday after that, we will have speakers that come and talk about that side of the story, basically. Um, but just to give you an idea, we have a few minutes low, like we, we only have nine minutes. So let me just go quickly about, uh, just go over this part, how arbitrary MP statements are turned into arithmetic cir circuits, which are uh, convenient for converting into this system, which is itself is a stepping stone to generating these polynomials. So you, you remember SAT, for example. So arithmetic circuit is basically satisfiability, except that we use addition and multiplication uh, to uh, instead of and and ors. So for or we use addition so, and, and multiplication. So this is how you reduce or, and this is how you reduce and, okay, into multiplication. And this is the uh, the negation. And so arithmetic circuits, capturing computation in, in arithmetic circuit, which can be concretely thought of as this, is also itself MP-complete. So we have a path from arbitrary MP problems into arithmetic circuits. Um, and then from arithmetic circuits, you can think of RNCS as us pouring, we have mixed the cake and we are pouring it into its mold. So it looks in a, it looks like it looks in the same shape every time. Um, and at the last step, the, the 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 polynomials allow us to sample the cake in a few places without eat, having to eat the entire cake in order to verify that it's true. So what happens is the polynomials they will take. There is going to be a there is going to be a, a series of vectors of of, of uh, R one C S for each of these gates, for example. And so, what the what each polynomial will do, it will we we would zap up entire rows of R one C S into a single polynomial, and then we'll zap all, the, all of the polynomials and equalize that to zero, just like we did here. And we zap up all the polynomials into one giant one equalize it to zero, and then we'll di indirectly make statement about it using cap. So this is something we will hopefully go over end of this week and next week as well. Uh, but the most important thing, I don't think we have time to continue for, for, for the rest of it for today, but we'll, we'll pick up next time. But the important thing to remember is that we are here. Okay, all of this, we are starting from the MP-complete. This is the paradigm in which we are in. And this is the classes, the class of problems that we are dealing with, okay? And obviously there are, there are problems outside of MP and we're going to touch upon them next time as well. Not in details, but just to give you an idea. Um, and uh, so arithmetization is, just to summarize, it's a reduction. We reduce our problems into a series of polynomials in order to, in order to reduce the cost of verifying uh, those witnesses and to make it practically attractive. So those tools that we talked about, they are uh, ways for us to increase to increase the asymmetry. These tools are ways for us to increase the asymmetry between the proving, the proving and searching and verifying. Uh, so we only have five minutes, so we, we will not cover the rest of it today, but we will continue next time. Um, but hopefully you can now start seeing the big picture and where we came from and why we did what we did. Um, and hopefully that you know also make you understand the context in which you are digging now in in the uh, circum code bases and the audit that we that we have been doing.